Smartphones have become nearly ubiquitous in the United States, and these mini computers that we carry around in our bags or pockets have the potential to dramatically influence the practice of medicine, including psychiatry. A team of researchers is investigating the use of smartphones for what's known as digital phenotyping, or the continuous monitoring of someone's status via a personal digital device to enhance behavioral and mental health. J.P. Onella is assistant professor of biostatistics at the Harvard University School of Public Health and one of the co-authors of a recent perspective paper on the topic in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. One of the ways how we think this could be helpful is in terms of collecting and trying to quantify behaviors, real-world behaviors that we can actually measure using the smartphone. So typically, a lot of research in psychiatry has relied on surveys. One of the challenges with surveys is that it's very hard for people to remember what they've been doing and how they've been feeling the past few days. A typical question that I usually ask in class is, can you remember what you had for dinner two weeks ago? And most students will not be able to remember that. Now, if we think about the idea that we're asking patients who probably suffer from some type of cognitive decline, they would be even more um, hard-pressed to answer these types of questions. So one of the things that we're trying to do is, instead of classifying psychopathologies based on survey data and clinical interviews, we're trying to classify psychopathologies based on dimensions of behavior that we can actually observe and measure in the real world. And what are the ways people use smartphones that can contribute useful clinical information? So smartphones are very advanced and sophisticated devices, and we can collect different kinds of data from these devices. So the kind of data we really want to collect depends on the study, on the scientific questions. So one of the ideas behind digital phenotyping is that we can collect data both actively and passively. Let me give you a couple of examples. Active data would be something like asking patients to contribute audio samples in the form of an audio diary. And, and this could be, for example, on a daily basis. So in one ongoing study, we're asking patients to take one minute of their day, and they can essentially describe their day in free form and describe their day, their daily experiences. What we can do is we can take these data and we can try to analyze different aspects of, of audio. So to give you a couple of examples, we can be looking at something like intonation. Is the person's intonation completely flat or does it go up and down? We can also be looking at things like how much gap does the person have between words? Um, you know, how much audio is there in the entire recording versus silence? Another example of active data would be doing surveys. We call these surveys microsurveys because they're intended to be very short surveys that people take on a daily basis or almost on a daily basis. Then in contrast to active data, we have what we call passive data. Passive data is data that's collected in the background, so its collection doesn't require any input or attention from the patient. What are some examples of passive data? So a couple of examples of passive data would be something like accelerometer data, um, GPS data, phone communication logs, text message communication logs, and so on. So we can measure things like mobility patterns, but we can also look at uh, digital communication or phone-mediated communication. So we can look at things like what is your communication reciprocity, meaning if you call me five times, how frequently do I return that call? Think about a hypothetical patient who is bipolar. If the person is depressed, he or she might not leave the house. So the person might be spending a lot of time in the house. In contrast, if the um, person is manic, he or she might be going around town. So this is something that we can capture directly from the GPS of the smartphone. But that's just one quantity, just one metric. You know, all this data that you're talking about, this type of active data and the passive data that the cell phones are capturing constantly, the quantity of it sounds kind of overwhelming. So how could this actually be useful? In our project, we actually had two goals. Our first goal was to develop the software platform, what we call the uh, BWE Digital Phenotyping Platform. But our second goal is to develop statistical methods that take all of these data that we collect using smartphone and turn it into biomedically and clinically useful information. And I think ultimately, and I may be biased, and I probably am biased, but to me it seems like the way we analyze and model these data is going to be a key point moving forward.
Dr. Onella says this approach could be useful for a range of psychiatric disorders. At the moment, they're conducting pilot studies on bipolar disorder in order to understand how patients cycle between depression and mania and depression. And they're also investigating the technologies used for patients with PTSD. In the future, digital phenotyping could be a useful tool to study and monitor patients with alcoholism and substance abuse. One way the device could help patients is by enabling scientists to understand how the patient is faring and what treatments are actually effective by, with someone's approval, monitoring the patient's behavior. This type of research is crucial, says Dr. Onella, because mental health disorders not only are hugely debilitating to people and their families, but they cost the economy as well. Patient care often cycles among crises, emergency room visits, and hospitalization, often with few in-person evaluations in between such crises. Smartphones, however, could help objectively measure both disease and treatment, and could even eventually help prevent the cycle of crisis care. So right now, one of our main goals is to develop better phenotypes for psychiatric disorders. And if we're successful at this, then it might be possible to set up a system where your smartphone essentially is monitoring your behavior in continuous time. So one of the benefits of this approach is that we might be able to catch psychiatric episodes at the point where they're still evolving. In other words, we might be able to capture these episodes early on, and that might be a great point to intervene. Are you trying to get a baseline of the phenotypes of these mental disorders that you're studying? That depends to some extent on the on the specific study. So one of the major goals we have right now is to try to refine the phenotype for certain psychiatric conditions. So if you look at the DSM, which is the current gold standard for psychiatric diseases, there are in fact 256 combinations of symptoms that give somebody the diagnosis of major depressive disorder. What that means is that the uh, phenotype is extremely broad. One of the goals we have in, in some of these studies are try to refine that phenotype, and there are a couple of important implications. So one of the consequences of this is that we might be able to identify subtypes of, of depression. Another thing that might be useful is we might be able to identify patients who respond better to certain type of therapy or certain type of medication. If we cannot measure the subtleties of these disorders, it's going to be very difficult to treat these patients. In your conclusion, you write about how smartphones could contribute to genomic approaches to precision medicine for psychiatry. How is that? So one of the things that we have struggled is to find and genetic associations between psychiatric disorders like depression. And one of the reasons could be that the phenotype for some of these diseases like depression is too broad. In other words, if we have tens or hundreds of different combinations of symptoms that jointly qualify as depression, it would be very hard to identify a genetic background or genetic association with these given symptoms. However, if we can find smaller groups of symptoms, then we might be in a better position to explore the genetic contribution to diseases like depression. That links back to what you were saying earlier about almost dividing diseases into subgroups. That's right. So that's exactly one of the ideas here. So we could think about depression essentially as some type of an umbrella term. But if we can identify subgroups of disorders within that, we might be able to establish a stronger genetic association with these diseases. Dr. Onella says these pilot studies should help pave the way for the use of this technology to improve the care of behavioral and mental health. This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. J.P. Onella is co-author of the article, Harnessing Smartphone-Based Digital Phenotyping to Enhance Behavioral and Mental Health. To read this perspective article, among others, visit www.nature.com NPP. I'm Cynthia Graber.